actually it's time for us to install it. And then I speak about the Gaia proper So I'll just get the points out of the way first. bindings they have no functionality at all? The, the bindings, what they do is that they call the C++ code from uh, Python. So basically it's just a layer, like everything that you can do... But, but what I mean is this, this layer has no logic, it, it's just calling... No. Yes, okay. the difference is like the frame generator which I showed you, uh, it's the only difference I can think of. All the rest that I showed you is C++. And you also said that this was uh, dynam dynamically generated. Oh, I'm alright. Um, I mean, these bindings. Well, that's what you mean by dynamically generated. Uh, not exactly. Uh, I mean, what, what, what do you mean? I, I don't know. Maybe you're using a tool that reads the C code and do, does the binding. Uh, I do this for Gaia. You still have to do a little bit of work, uh, but it's not so much a good idea. For Essentia, they've been written by hand uh, because we need it to be very efficient. Because when you put data into an algorithm and get it out, uh, you don't want to be copying all the time, otherwise, you will be too slow. So, Essentia is written by hand. However, the good thing is that we only need to do it once because all the algorithm, the instance of the class algorithm, and uh, all the algorithm are instances of the same class. So just had to do the bindings for the class algorithm, model, and uh, that means that all the different algorithms were automatically generated. Uh, I know, okay, maybe, maybe what you think. Uh, what I said is that if you write a new algorithm in C++, <coughs> you don't have to do anything for the bindings, you automatically get them in Python because if you do a new algorithm, it's an instance of this class and this class is already wrapped with the Python language. So adding new algorithm, you just need to do it in C++ and you have it available immediately in Python without any work. You don't have to write any bindings. So that's, uh, it's annoying, super boring, and uh, yeah. But, but they, they have to be generated. Yes, but it's just, you just say uh, compile bindings or scores Python, and this compiles it, but you don't have to write any code. Uh, you have to yeah, you have to compile it. First. And and the last thing, yes. uh, there were like two modes, the like yes. the normal one and the yes. streaming one. Um, you can do the streaming one also with C++. I yes. mean, yeah, it's not C++ And actually, uh, most of the algorithms. Uh, have one implementation, let's say one um, uh, how would you call that? canonical implementation, which is either in standard or streaming, whichever is the easiest, and the other one is deduced from the first one. So, for instance, let's say uh, you have the FFT algorithm, so it takes one frame inside, uh, in and outputs one frame. Uh, so, you write the, the standard algorithm. The streaming one is just a wrapper that says wrap this algorithm and it takes one in, one out, and the, this is the only code you have to write for streaming. You don't have to rewrite the whole algorithm in, in streaming. Uh, 
some, somehow done the other way around because it was easier to write the streaming one and wrap it in a standard one. Um, but all the implementations that I had seen, most, nearly all, they are only written once uh, in C++. Then either a standard or streaming is uh, <coughs> from this implementation and then the Python bindings are generated from, from their code. So, yeah, basically what I mean is that if you write one algorithm, uh, you get it available in all, or easily in all the modes, uh, C++, Python, streaming, standard. them in any order uh, except that Python needs to be the first. Uh, set of tools need to go before another one which I don't remember so it's good idea to it goes in second. And all the rest you can start uh, in any order. When you have everything installed, uh, you can log uh, ice item, and if you type import ice two and it doesn't complain, then uh, you do to work.
and uh, you'd like to spare some space in the hard disk, and you say, okay, instead of like having 10 copies of the same song, I'm going to find the ones that are similar. But the thing is, like, you cannot compare directly the songs like binary because one came from a CD and the other one you downloaded it from iTunes and the other one this. So they are not exactly the same files, although the content is nearly exactly similar. So you can say, well, I'm going to find the duplicates not by looking at their file <coughs> but by saying that if the distance between those two songs is very, very low, I mean, under the threshold that's like nearly zero, you don't say zero because there's always this small stuff like you record it to MP3 or you record it to WAV file, which in the end is, you won't hear it, but there is a difference at the binary level. Uh, you say, well, if they're under this threshold, well, I can say they're duplicates and, and then I can remove the duplicates. Um, so that these are all the, the, the motivations that we have. And so the main points of Gaia is that, uh, first of all, it allows you to deal with like lots of songs and lots of descriptors. Uh, in the order of the million, so we have a database of a few million songs, uh, does it in a fast way, and it allows you to uh, work with similarity. So to do this, uh, there are two main things, it's like it allows you to work with distances, that is you can create distances that, uh, that uh, match pretty much anything you want. You can create a distance that's focused on rhythm, distance that's focused on tonal aspects, everything. And then there's a thing, uh, there's also a bit of, uh, let's say, data management. Because when you get all the information from Essentia, sometimes you don't want all of it. So you want to do feature selection, for instance. So you want to discard some features. Uh, you want to uh, merge some features that come from a different source, uh, etc. And you want to work with those features uh, uh, so the representation of those songs, uh, basically, uh, they are points in a high dimensional space. Well, not necessarily <coughs> high, but in a, in a multi-dimensional space. So the idea is that all the songs, all the data you get from Essentia, you represent it as a point. I mean, that's a very easy uh, representation. And you work in this space with those points. Uh, the distance then is just the distance from two points. So for instance, uh, let's go to the light just very quickly. Uh, these are my songs. You say, okay, this is a space. Like this is abstract. Actually, we're talking about songs here because you're doing some stuff in audio. Uh, it could be images, could be anything, uh, except that the data we have comes from a sensor. And you say, for instance, well, okay, the distance. You define this distance. So from this point to this point. Uh, and you can so. One important thing is the distance, the, the choice of the distance. The other one is that you can transform the space uh, into another space. For instance, you can normalize the values. So if you have a descriptor, say spectrocentric, that goes from zero to uh, something rate, you want it between zero and one. So you're basically just changing the distance. I'm going to go back uh, to this later. Um, so that's for Gaia. Uh, so again, as for Essentia, there's the documentation which you can download from the site. Uh, I'm going to start here. Um, and I, you upload the file? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm glad you are giving. that you can uh, download, uh, which we're going to use very soon.
Um, so that, that's what uh, the GKI documentation looks. <coughs> Uh, so there's like one introduction that says a little bit about say uh, and a pretty good main uh, link. So there's an overview, there's a tutorial also. Uh, there are some more links about dealing with large stuff. Uh, mostly the tutorial and the overview is what you want to read first. And there's a reference. Uh, so as I said, there's two important things. One is the distance functions. I think you get this file. This file is from the um, uh, the stuff from the Amplab class. You have uh, where you download the, the zip file for Sensor Gaia and everything. There's a Gaia doc. Uh, yeah, there's the Gaia doc. So in the so here you have a list of the distances that. transformation uh, which are here. Uh, I'm going to look at them later. Um, first I'm going to start with uh, First of all, uh, let's say that you have a database of songs, like this one, and you uh, analyze them with the Sensia. So basically, you have all those files, uh, they're called .sec the because they're signature, <coughs> which look like uh, a complex version. Uh, so this is what you get from, from the Sensia. And here you actually have like lots and lots of descriptors. Right, you have like cost, cost progression, cost current, like you have those high level descriptors, uh, energy, blah 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 blah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, this is a nice format for you to read, but it's not so nice for a computer to deal with. It's not also, it's also not very efficient. And so the first thing you have to do is uh, start Python. So here again, uh, everything is the namespace Gaia2, uh, so I just import everything from Gaia2. So the first thing that uh, you can do is these files uh, that you saw that you get from Essentia, uh, I'm going to import them in Gaia. So in Gaia you have the, the basic uh, structure, let's say, it's a, it's a point. Here I'm creating a point and I want to load a point. So So now I've loaded this point, it's, uh, it's loaded in memory, uh, it contains the same data but in a, in a much more efficient uh, structure and you can, well the point doesn't have a name, so you can set the name. And they also have uh, properties which contain all those values, so for instance, uh, if you want to access access the call ski, uh, you would access it as if it was a dictionary in Python, so you just type call ski, and this gets you the value. Uh, note that in Essentia, uh, you can get as output uh, values as well as strings, like for instance this is not a value, this is a, a label, this is a string, and Gaia can load both of them. So 
for instance, if you say um, all, so D major, this corresponds to this. Uh, D major, if you look at the changes rate, you get the same values. Uh, so here you have a point. Uh, for axes, do they have a base? Yes, uh, at the moment, uh, at the moment I haven't loaded the database yet. I'm going to do it in a second. Because uh, this is a point from Essentia. So if I want to create a database, I could uh, either load all the points one by one, which would be very tedious and very slow, and then get them together in a data set. Uh, there's, um, there's a script that comes with Gaia. Uh, but first of all, there was Gaia merge, which would merge all the signatures from uh, Essentia, all the files from Essentia into a dataset. And there's an enhanced version, uh, which is called Gaia Fusion, uh, which merges everything and can merge databases, which are also very, very big. With Gaia merge, you had to juggle a bit, you had to struggle with memory. This is the easy version. So you just say, uh, you don't have to do this, I'm just showing you. Uh, I get all the files from Essentia and I want to put them in a database. So for instance, I do this. Uh, it takes some time. It goes much faster if it's not in a virtual machine. Uh, I'll put some information which you don't need to know about. And then you have your database, which is a single file, which contains all the files from Essentia here. So now, instead of working with single points, what I can do is I can work with a complete data set. So if I create my data set, and this you can do with the file that you downloaded, you should be able to load the data set. So now it's loaded. Uh, so for instance, I can ask for the size of the data set. That's me, there's like 428 files, which is the number of files that were in my directories. Uh, the data set basically does uh, nothing except storing the data from the file. So you can have access to the points. So if I say uh, data set dot zero, so it says that this weird thing, but basically it's a Gaia two point. So if you say that, for instance, you can access to it, this is my point, you can ask for the name, you can ask for the data, same as before, so you can ask for the for key, for instance. Uh, yes, one thing, if you have, data in Essentia that is uh, like that, for instance, bar bands. Uh, if I want to access the bar bands, uh, it's not complete, it's not the descriptors. I have to ask either for the mean of the bar bands or the variance of the bar bands. Because bar bands uh, acts like a namespace. So to do this, you ask, uh, you separate it with a, with a point, like a period. So if I want the mean of the bar bands, I ask for parkbanks.mean and here you get the values. Um, the, sorry, but a very basic question. And the database in which format does it has to be JSON? No, it's a binary format. It's a specific format. So if we, for instance, want to analyze a data set from MATLAB, uh, how do we do that? You would have to use a script to convert it yourself. So uh, the, the only thing that Gaia can read natively is this format from Essentia, which is a YAML format, which is uh, kind of like JSON format, maybe some, some of you know, it's actually a superset. So if your data is in JSON, uh, Gaia can read it also too. So maybe a way to do that is to import everything to FreeSAM, then pass it to JSON and already use Essentia, the Essentia yes. thing that is implemented in FreeSAM. Because yes. the similarity that Prism uses is already Gaia or yes. Okay. Uh, or not. Uh, they use Gaia. I uh, think they might use some collaborative function tool, which I'm not sure about. <coughs> I don't remember. I think you have a free sound class in 
coming in a few weeks, so uh, ask. Not remember, but uh, if the if you used, uh, I think yeah, free sound has the. I mean, it had the gas clarity, and at some point it was not very visible on the website, or when they redesigned the website, it was not available, and maybe it's available now again. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But, but if they do audio similarity, it's it's kind yeah. And behind it, then you said to pass it to YAML, then YAML, and then do it with the sensei, and then take it from the sensei to live. Uh, no, it's the opposite. Uh, when you upload something to free sound, what happens? No, no, without free sound, I mean. Or even free sound. You give the audio file to Essentia, which computes the YAML, then this comes out of Essentia. Okay. And this then you can add it to Gaia. Okay. So it's like direct pass, like from, from a single song to uh, YAML. You go to Essentia, you get one representation from one song, and then all of those go into Gaia directly. If you have something from, from a different source, um, this data set here uh, and these points, uh, you can access them uh, quite easily. Uh, so if you want to create uh, different points or if you want to add values, you can add them as if it was a dictionary. Thank you. Um, Sorry. You, yes? You, you were uh, calling the, the bar bands of the single file that you load it with B don't load. Yes. But now it's we are not using the database. Uh, so that's a single file, which I did at the beginning. Then I loaded the database here. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Uh, change name and here I say that B so change actually this is a second B, this is not the same one. Uh, is the first point in the data set. The first point. Yes, as I say, data set. Data set, you can, you can think of it as a list of points. Basically, it's, it's nothing more than that. It's like a big matrix. Uh, to say that a point, if you imagine a point which is a feature vector, so that's. Well, that's a single point, and it's a feature vector, so it contains lots of values. The way it's stored in memory is actually nearly exactly that. And you get the values that from here to here, for instance, this is the HPCP values. From here to here, you have uh, the key and the mode. From here to here, uh, you have the MLCC, for instance. So this is like a single feature vector. Uh, which you use in MATLAB, uh, well, MATLAB, Weka, and so on. The <coughs> problem with this is that it's a single vector, and you don't know if I tell you this value, what is it, and you're like, yes, yeah, the value number 17, and you have to look at it. Uh, the access is not that easy. Uh, Gaia is as efficient because it stores it as a single vector, everything is very compact, but you can access it as if it was like a nice dictionary, like you access given, giving the name, and it knows that if you ask for the key, it's this descriptor. And you never, uh, and the computer does it for you. So you never say, assume that, for instance, descriptor 27 is Park Benz, when in fact that was in an old data set you had, and the new one you have changed everything. Um, the data set is just a collection of point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, etc., uh, which have the same uh, feature vector, the same feature set. And so this, this is like a huge, uh, huge matrix. And basically the data set is nothing more than that. The data set doesn't do anything, doesn't do any transformation. This is done uh, separately. The only uh, thing that the data set does is store everything in an efficient way and allows you to access to it very easily. Like you don't have to, to remember where the descriptors are, like you just have to remember the name. But if you ask, for instance, for the mean, it knows that it needs to get uh, fragments up here, it needs to get this part, take it out, and return it for you. So if you want to have access to it, you can. And then, <coughs> yes. Yes. But um, then Gaia, it looks more like a 
that is structured on a database at all? Yes, well, that's the, that's the data set only. There's more to come. Um, yes? For login, the data set? Yes. The DS, you have to instance it the one thing? Yes. Then you have to instance it first and then load. Uh, we have done that, say, data set of a file, but there are just like one more line. So now, um, so now this is one thing. So this is your data. And the next thing you want to do is probably you want to compute distances. Say it like you want So you have to create your distances first. And the uh, so here I'm going to go quickly uh, over the list of distances. So you get an idea. Uh, so it's a long list. Um, the most useful one. So you have the you have two types of distances. Which don't see here. You have uh, real distances. So for instance, the Euclidean distance is a distance. You know how to compute the distance between two points. And then you have uh, what I call uh, both distances, for instance, you want to say that uh, instead of having a distance, Euclidean distance, for instance, to go from zero to uh, infinity plus plus, depends on the values of your uh, of your data. Uh, you could say, <coughs> I want a distance that uh, does like a, compresses it using uh, exponential. So you want the exponential of a distance, or you want a distance which is a linear combination between two distances. So I have the Euclidean distance and I have some other distance that I compute. And you say actually the distance I want to use is like half of this distance plus half of this distance. Um, so the useful ones is the, the Euclidean distance. So you hope you know it. Uh, you have the Manhattan distance which is instead of being square root, the square values is the uh, absolute uh, values of the absolute difference. Uh, random distance, which is used to give a random distance, so this is used for evaluation. Uh, you have uh, rhythmic distance that's used on rhythm descriptors. Uh, I'm not going to go over too much about those distances because <coughs> some of them are very specific depending on, on what we do. So I'm just going to stay with the Euclidean distance. I mean, there's the cosine similarity, which is very used for collaborative filtering. So for instance, uh, you can also use Gaia for collaborative filtering, which means that you, you get the same structure, except the data that comes in is not the data from Essentia. It's the data from the users who have downloaded the packages or this kind of stuff. Um, so let's start. Um, So the thing I want to do here is I want to get my distance, so first distance, uh, which I call Euclidean list. And I'm going to have to create it, so here it's not as nice as in Essentia where everything is like in the namespace of the algorithm. Uh, you have to use a factory to create it. Uh, it's a bit annoying, I know, but Okay, I guess. So when you create a distance, you have to give it the name of the distance you want to create, and you have to give uh, one uh, argument that you always have to give is the layout of the data set. So what is the layout? The layout is all the descriptors that are contained in your point, so for, in your data set. So if I create the layout of the data set, uh, which is like this. Basically, it's the list of all the descriptors that you could find uh, in, the, in the point. Uh, these values are the position they have like in this uh, feature vector. Uh, the, these values and this you don't need to care about. Just remember that the layout is the descriptors that uh, the dataset contains. To put points in the dataset, they all need to have the same layout. 
because if you have some points, let's say some files in the sense that if you the BPM and some others that don't, you cannot put those together in the data set because if I say uh, compute the distance of the BPM, some points will have it, some points will not have it. So everything needs to be consistent. Uh, so that's why the layout is important because it makes sure that we're talking about the same thing. There's not there's something that might also happen sometimes. You get some database, you get some data from it, you analyze it. Later you say I want more stuff in my database, you get it, you analyze it with a different version of Essentia. Uh, trust me, it has happened lots of times. And then you try to put this together and at some point like your results look garbage because you didn't realize but some stuff had changed between the two versions of Essentia and you're not comparing uh, apples to apples. Um, so this layout is uh, something that says the shape of the data set and when you create the distance, you need it because the distance needs to be optimized for a specific data set. So when you create the Euclidean distance, uh, what you're saying is, uh, I'm going to here you say, I want an Euclidean distance, and I want it to be used on this data set. And you have to say it now, not later, so that it can be optimized. Just remember that you always have to keep the layout when you create the distance. So there's one more thing that we need uh, to compute the distance uh, is a view. So a view is kind of like if you um, if you know a bit about SQL, you have views on the database that do lots of stuff that don't touch the data but allows you to have access to it. Uh, so here I'm just creating my view on my data set. And the view is the structure that does uh, all the distance calculations and everything. So it has one main function, which is called NN search. So NN search for nearest neighbor search. Uh, you need to give it, so remember, we're, what we want to do is we want to take one point and find all the points that are similar to this one. So you need to give it a query point. So let me get one. So let me get one point which I want to query for. <coughs> so for instance, this point is. Okay, this point is this one. And with my view, um, I will search for this point using a given distance. So the distance I just created. Um, because at any point in time, you can search for any point with any distance. If you have different distances, you can, you can change it. And this gives you a result set. Uh, again, this might seem like, why don't you give me all the points? Uh, this is done for performance reasons. Because uh, if I do this on a database of one million songs, and I say, okay, look for all the points, you're going to get one million results ordered by the distance. And to get one million results is too much. So the result set, you need to say how many points you want to get. So you say get uh, five. This gets you the first five points. So uh, to sum up, with my view, which is a view on the data set, data set doesn't move, doesn't do anything. So the view searches on the data set, and it searches for this point using this distance. And then you say, it's, okay, give me uh, five results. So as you can see, uh, our query point was uh, this point. So the first result, it's kind of uh, expected that it's the same point and the distance is zero. Because if you look for a point in the data set in which uh, the point is, the closest point to a point is itself. And then you get all the other ordered by uh, distance. Any questions on this? You are looking now for three the closest ones. Yes. Five closest. Yes. Five closest ones. And if you don't do anything, it's going to give a score for all the ones. No. It computes anyway the score for all the ones, but if I would have to print them, that's too much. So this. Five closest. All of them. <coughs> five closest. The five closest in order. Yes, in order. Uh, if you say 
you, you can also do pagination. So this gives me the five clauses. This gives me the five clauses starting from the fifth. So for instance, you know when you have when you do search like Google or anything, it says like that many results out of like a hundred thousand. If you go on Google, you don't get a page with like the two thousand results. You get the ten first, so then you say okay, give me the next ten ones. And so that's a way to do it. With the result set is a structure that you can uh, manipulate easily, but if you would have the exact results like printed to you, uh, that would be too much and way too slow. So this gives the five uh, following results. Because the Euclidean distance which you calculated is also multidimensional, or it's a single value. The Euclidean distance is also a. Uh, it's it's like uh, because the features were there were lo lots of features. Yes. So for every feature you calculate. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to it. So this uh, when you create this distance here, I just say I want Euclidean distance, and I didn't say anything else. So by default. Uh, it will compute the distance on all the descriptors, which is a lot. And there's also one thing that you might notice: uh, these values are like super high, and like they don't make much sense. Why is that? Because you took the values from the Satya as they were. So, uh, for instance, there are some values that are small. Okay, quite nice. Uh, but then there are some other values that uh, should be very high somewhere. Well, this one's like 400. Not very high yet. You have 1,500. Uh, basically, there's one thing like all the features that they, they don't all belong together. They're, they're not in the same order of, of size. Um, so the first thing, for instance, you might want to do is say, I don't want the Euclidean distance on all the descriptors because it's a mess. I only want it on a few descriptors. So you add some parameters when you create the distance. You say instead of being a distance on everyone, it's a distance on and actually, let's go to the documentation of the distance first, so you can see. The Euclidean distance, there's some stuff that generally you don't care. Uh, it's the description that you do care about. And here you see that when you create distance, you can give them parameters. And the parameters for uh, the Euclidean distance consist of uh, descriptor names, which is the names of the descriptors you want to include. Uh, as it's a Euclidean distance, you can only use real descriptors, which means uh, you cannot do the Euclidean distance over the key or something, because the distance between D major, the Euclidean distance between D major and E minor doesn't mean a lot of things. Uh, and you can also use wildcards. So that means that, uh, okay, just I'll go to wildcards right now. This is the list of descriptors you want, except it's the list of descriptors that you do not want. So you can say you can filter. Wildcard means that wildcard means that, for instance, um, if I look at the layout of the data set again, you see there's like lots of descriptors, and you could say maybe I want to use the Euclidean distance over all the spectral descriptors, so which start with spectral underscore. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, okay. So I want to create my distance. Yes. Uh, 
not in the Euclidean distance, but uh, later. I'll show how to do this later. Um, so here, for instance, let's just get the spectral descriptors. Uh, so these are my, par my parameters. Uh, so every distance actually has a set of parameters that they can accept. Uh, nearly all of them accept the descriptor names, because you can say I want distance on, on those names. And for the others, you have to look at the distances. Um, yeah, we're going to look at it after. Um, so if I create this distance, and I do uh, my search again, uh, I get uh, actually. Okay, that's my distance one. And then let's call this one distance. Two. My first distance, so Euclidean on everyone, uh, I get this. And if I get my second distance, so which is the same distance, the Euclidean distance, but only on a subset of descriptors, I get this, uh, which is have different uh, things and here so you could uh, do ways which would be one way to do it uh, but we do it in another way which is that uh, before taking the distance we are going to transform the data that's in there so you can say at the moment of computing the distance I'm uh, taking the distance and adjusting uh, when I'm computing the distance or you could say I'm going to take this data set and I'm going to change the data in it so that the data that we're going to use is uh, in a better shape. Uh, so there's a simple transformation. For instance, you could say just drop half of it, like I don't want those descriptors and only keep certain descriptors. Uh, you could say uh, there's another data set on the side and I want to get them together. And there's a numerical transformation. So for instance, you could say normalize the value between 0 and 1. So these are listed. Uh, these are transformation. Um, transformation algorithm. So I'm not going to enter in detail here, but when you transform a data set, uh, so you want to normalize the value, for instance, uh, this is a two step process because first you need to know what values you're going to need to normalize. Like you need to look at the data set and say, okay, this goes from 0 to 10,000, so I need to divide by 10,000. And then you actually divide the stuff. There's a good reason that it's separate, but uh, we're just going to do the two steps at once uh, at the moment. So there's um, these data set management algorithms. Uh, this is the full list, and this is the list that uh, is split in two. Data set management is what I told you. It's like you keep half of it. Job, uh, let's look at it. So you can add one descriptor, you can remove descriptors that are constant or that, are, that have infinite values that are annoying. Uh, there are a few transformations which are done specifically for optimization of memory usage and speed. Uh, you can select a few descriptors, you can rename a descriptor, you can remove some descriptor. So this is just uh, juggling with the data. Uh, these are not so important, the ones that are, well, from a research point of view, the ones that are important are those ones. Um, so 
So, uh, put three or not, so put three. Uh, the easiest one is probably the uh, normalized uh, transformation, which takes the values and normalizes them. So you can specify uh, if you want them. Uh, uh, you can specify which descriptor you want to normalize. So same as the, as the distances, you can say. Uh, you can say whether you want to normalize uh, from 0 to 1 using the minimum and the maximum values. When you're normalizing, you're, what you're actually doing, uh, you're taking all the descriptors in the column, you're looking for the maximum, minimum, and then you normalize this so that this is 0 and this is 1. You can do this, but let's say if all the values are already between 0 and 1, and you have one value which is 10,000, uh, this value is actually very annoying. So it's called an outlier because all the values are 0 and 1, and there's one guy that uh, changes all the data set and makes it that if you normalize between 0 and 1, all of those are going to be crunched and because of only this one. So sometimes you do not necessarily want to normalize using the minimum and the maximum, but you normalize using the variance. So you look at the variance of all this data set and the standard deviation, and you normalize using that. So for instance, if they're all between 0 and 1, and this one is 10,000, uh, standard deviation is going to be around 0, 05 or so. So it's going to represent the majority of things. Uh, so this is less sensitive. Um, this is the outliers. So this is uh, so you can specify the outliers. You can specify whether uh, you normalize using the variance. Uh, there's a, a few different uh, options. And then there are um, some more complex stuff. So you have the Gaussianized transformation also, which instead of normalizing, uh, it makes it so that the distribution of one descriptor uh, follows a normal distribution. This has many advantages. Uh, so it makes some, some transformation, which is uh, a bit complex. But what you get at the end is that if you look at the distribution after that of your uh, values, it's a, it's a Gaussian. So that's very really useful uh, because it has some nice properties. Um, for instance, the PCA and RCA are algorithms that are optimal if the distribution is Gaussian. So it's nice to have, so you say, okay, let's make them Gaussian first. Um, and actually, I'm going to explain this a little bit more in detail uh, on, the, uh, on the board. So very quickly, kind of quickly, I'm not going to make a full class on it, but just uh, get an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I know this is a bit more complex than the sensor, it's a bit more abstract, uh, but uh, uh, bear with me. So let's say that you have, uh, so we're going back to our space with our points, right? yeah, points everywhere. So for instance, uh, okay, let's first start with normalization. So, Let's say I have two descriptors, very easy. One descriptor, two descriptor, for drawing it's going to be very nice. Uh, I have a data set which is like that. That's not very nice because let's say if you say you want to compute the distance between two points, you see that there's one dimension which is nearly useless because uh, the only distance that is going to be counting is the y distance. So normalization, what it does is it takes this and it says, I'm going to put everything between 0 and 1. So you end up with this data set which looks like this, if I can be uh, thin. You end up with a data set uh, where this is 0, 1, this is 1. And your data set is going to be like, OK, all those points are between 0 and 1. And here you see that already it makes more sense to actually do this before trying to compute the distance.
distance because if you compute the Euclidean distance here, uh, it's kind of biased. I mean, it makes sense if you have values that go to 10,000 and the other one is between 0 and 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. The one that's very small, I mean, you could just as well drop it because it's not going to have any influence on the distance. Uh, so that's the normalization. Uh, the next one is uh, the Gaussianization, uh, which says that if you have a distribution which is uh, kind of like that, for instance, this is annoying because uh, your distribution looks like, like that. The, whole, the Gaussian ice is gonna uh, move the points so that they're centered around the origin or around the and the further away you go, the less points you have. So this, which is a completely weird distribution, I mean you don't see this in, in nature a lot of time, uh, it's gonna look like like this, like this uh, Again, it has some nice properties. So even though here you see that we're actually doing something which is uh, lossy, you lose information because you're like putting them here, uh, it's useful for doing uh, lots of stuff. Um, could, could you normalize and then do the Gaussian? Yes, but uh, the way the Gaussian is implemented, uh, it has no effect. I mean, doing the Gaussianize, uh, it's exactly the same as doing the normalized and the Gaussianized. But you can do it, and there are other ways of doing the Gaussianized which uh, could uh, make it useful to do the normalization. Uh, normalization in any case is nice because then you get values which you can work with. Uh, so in practice, uh, when I was doing stuff, Often I do normalize because I always do normalize, and then later I realize I want to Gaussianize, I Gaussianize on top of it, which is kind of useless, but it's like you get the hang of it. Um, so this is normalized Gaussianize, very uh, one dimensional. Uh, now the PCA, so PCA is, um, say you have. So instead of having this distribution, you have something like that. <coughs> so if you normalize, you say, well, okay, this is like about the same as this, so it's normalized here, it's not going to change anything. However, you can still see that, um, I still see a tendency is that uh, if I look at this axis, uh, like all the points seem like they're around this axis and not so much around this axis. You can see that there's this. What PCA does is it tries to find this uh, by looking at the maximum of the variance and in which direction you have your variance. So you can see that uh, following this axis, you have lots of variance, like the, point, the points are very widespread. On this axis, not so much. So you might want to say, but well, instead of working with like this uh, x and y, uh, I could as well rotate the whole thing so that uh, actually rotate it like that, uh, so that you're actually looking at this uh, coordinate, uh, these coordinates, and then you do uh, kind of the same thing as normalize is on each axis. Uh, stretch it so it looks like uh, more or less the same. Um, so this would turn it around. And so if you do PCA on this data set with this X and this Y, you end up with something. So you translate this, uh, which is called like that. Uh, PCA also does something. Uh, the algorithm you can say. Uh, on two dimensions, uh, well actually it, it doesn't scale it, but you can say uh, here I have two dimensions with the, the say you have 400, 
So you say, if I can find something like that, maybe here, uh, there's only this axis that's important, because this is what I'm going to be able to use to differentiate points. But if I have a point that's, uh, let's say, here and here, you say, ah, they, they might be similar. If I have one which is here and here, you say, okay, this is like an important information because they are further apart. Uh, so PCA, you can say, okay, do this like straightening kind of thing to identify the dimensions. And when you do this PCA, what you end up having is the first dimension is the one which has the biggest variance. Second dimension is the, the, dimension, the second dimension that has the biggest variance once you remove the first dimension, etc. Et um, you could say, well, at the end, I only have dimensions which have like very little variance, and I could just like drop the whole thing because there's not much information in it because all the information I have here uh, is already contained in my first dimension. Basically, you could think uh, you could think of it as a way to concentrate the information into the first dimensions, and then you could drop the data once. Uh, the, there are two advantages to this. Uh, one is that you have way fewer dimensions. Instead of working with 400 dimensions, you work with 20 dimensions. Uh, this is an advantage because it's faster, uh, uses less memory, and you also remove some noise. Uh, usually, what well, noise depends what you do, if you do classification tasks or everything, you realize that very, very often, uh, the last dimensions of the PCA, they're completely useless. All the information that you actually want from your data set, from your points, is contained in the, in the first dimension after doing a PCA. Um, so it's very nice to do. Uh, basically, it's a way of compacting uh, your representation without losing information. What uh, would be the difference of doing this or doing a singular value in uh, This, uh, it's very similar. Uh, this uses the eigenvalues for the singular value uh, and I couldn't say exactly uh, the PCA has been shown that if the distribution of your points is Gaussian it's the optimal uh, transformation with respect to uh, least square as error um, if not then what not uh, I couldn't say exactly There's another one, um, which is very similar to PCA, uh, is RCA, which is Relevant Component Analysis, uh, which is like PCA, you just take your whole database and you say, okay, uh, let's just see what it looks like. Uh, RCA does it, but not looking at the database as a whole, but looking at different classes. So for instance, if you know that you have in your database, you have rock song, electro, pop, classical, jazz, uh, it does the PCA in a smarter way. So let's say that um, your database looks something like this. Um, if you do PCA on this database, what you're going to have is it's going to look and it's like very nicely spread so I'm not going to do anything you know, like spread x, same as y, same as the whole direction and PCA here is going to be uh, saying nothing RCA uh, says uh, you also give me the information of the classes that's in your database, so like subgroups of your points and here you can see that for instance there's one which is like that one which is like that and it basically does the same thing as the PCA is it tries to uh, find where we have the most information so for instance on this one it's going to be here on this one here so RCA uh, will do the same as PCA so in this case uh, we'll rotate it uh, so that it goes like that and then you can separate the two classes uh, easier um, that's pretty much the same condition